Now introduce our guest speaker. Um, I thought it was a big deal. I came on my anniversary, and she came from Philly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trish is the Family Service Director for Recovery Centers of America. She's been a therapist for 25 years, um, trained and working extensively with families, young adults, and adolescents with behavioral health and substance use disorders. So that's what we're thinking about. And she has worked in a number of settings, outpatient, inpatient, residential, community settings. She specializes in working with people with ADHD, opiate use in young adults, trauma-informed care, developmental trauma, trauma and substance use, trauma in the family system. Um, family engagement and substance use for today's teens. So it's something we see that's a big part of a lot of the children and a lot of the young adults that have substance abuse. She's been in private practice as well, specializing in adults and young ad um, adolescents with ADHD and trauma. So please join me in welcoming Trish. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I have to say, I normally stop people from doing the introduction. <laughs> it, seems, it seems so um, arrogant. <laughs> For no other way I can say it. Having somebody read it when you're coming up here, you're like, we actually don't care as long as you know what you're talking about. Um, so I do. So that's the good news, right? And so I appreciate that you guys are here today. What I wouldn't mind, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background as to my experiences that'll help so based off of kind of what was said so I appreciate that um, and the nice words but just to get a sense as to what you're hoping for right so I know that you know as I was talking to some people just trying to figure out so ADHD is a huge um, it's a huge conversation right because it's one of the biggest disorders that is probably the most underrated and so while it is both overdiagnosed it is also underappreciated. And so in the world of substance use, which is where I spend my time, right, I've been with RCA for the last two years, and so I am grateful. You know, I, I speak to the same mission, is that, you know, I'm the director of family services, so my job is to make sure that we're involving the families, right? My job is that substance use people heal in the context of other people, right, that we're not in a vacuum, and so making sure that as people become impacted by this disease that everybody that's going to be impacted starts to receive education and support and so that's really what my job is but in that through some of the experiences that I've had there's topics that s tend to have and resonate a little stronger with me ADHD is one of them and so I'm gonna give a little bit of the background. I will say, so I specialize in ADHD and trauma. So even within RCA, right? So even though I'm the director of family services, families are my priority. I've also been a part of the you know, integration of our trauma programming. So when we've created the trauma programming, I've been a part of that. So trauma and ADHD are two of those things that are really um, important for me because I work with adolescents, because I work with young adults, and because I work with families. And so I am from Philadelphia, right? And so. I am involved in a national organization called NOPE, so Narcotics Overdose Prevention and Education. It came out of Florida. And so it's an evidence-based program that goes into schools. And they have one that's during the day that is geared towards those that are in school. So it can be college age, high school, or middle school. And then they have an evening program that's geared towards the families. So how do we understand what's going on with our kids? How do we stop, right? How do we prevent? our children from being impacted by this disease, right? Particularly when we're talking about opioids, right? And the access to prescriptions. And what I was struck with was that every time, and so part of the evening is that a family member who had lost somebody to the disease, so it's not a scared straight because we know that that's ineffective, right? That's already been proven to be ineffective. But it's really an opportunity to help people understand the disease because we are fighting the stigma, because the stigma is what's keeping people from being honest, right? The stigma is what's keeping people from having and seeking out the help that they might need, because there's no other disease that we need to protect quite as much as this one. And I'm going to say this with all clarity, this is a disease. And so if there's anybody in here that says, I don't actually agree with that, I'm happy to have continued conversations and I'm happy to continue to do that at a later time. But we know that that is within the medical field. And so there's controversy of like, are we saying that if this is a disease, it's forever? 
it is, right? That we know that this is, that this is the humility to the drug for the rest of their lives, that they're battling something that every day they need to wake up and be humble to how physiological changes have occurred to them that predispose them. And so when I would speak at these evening programs, every single parent, grandparent, sister, brother that spoke on behalf of the person that they lost, I started hearing that they had untreated ADHD. Mm -hmm. And I had already been focusing on ADHD, right? I work with adolescents, and so this was coming up a lot um, in the schools and with opiate use and, uh, opiate use, and I was noticing it in regards to young adults. But here were all these family members that were identifying that they had somebody that was diagnosed but stopped following course of treatment, and then they ended up here. And so I will share in disclosure, I have a daughter that has ADHD who's 23, and so it was a bitter irony, right, that I was like, I started this field before she was born. This has always been one of my specialties because I've worked with adolescents my whole life, and then I was like, really? You, gotta, you gave me a child with it too? Like, it doesn't even make sense. I don't have it. <laughs> But as I was talking to more and more of the families, some of the things that I knew, every parent wished that they knew. And to a very large extent, there's a many days that I think this field might have just saved my daughter mm -hmm. because I had already known. And not because I loved her more or wanted her to do better than any other parent, but because I just happened to be in the profession and already knew about ADHD. And so that's really where I started to kind of push out and say there's got to be more trainings in the schools, to the families, to the people that are being impacted within the substance use field, because it's also the diagnosis that is the least talked about within substance use, yet it has the highest comorbidity. <laughs> and so in the substance use field, nobody's talking about it either. We're talking about depression and anxiety, which we need to, but we need to be talking about ADHD because there's consequences to it that could limit their ability to receive recovery because they don't have the skills in order to be able to successfully build recovery. And so that's really what this started stemming from. So I can talk a little bit about the differential. Sometimes people get those things confused with trauma and ADHD. That's why I specialize in both. Because I wanted people, when I went and spoke, I wanted them to know, I know that there's trauma. I also know that there's ADHD and both are real and both have consequences in regards to physiological changes that occur to the brain and things that we can do that are more effective in treating it. All right, so as we kind of go through this, do you have any questions? Was there something that you were like, ADHD, I really want to know this about that particular topic that you want to make sure that I'm going to hit? And I'm going to hit as much as I can within the hour, right? When, when is the average age that you start noticing some of the ADHD um, behaviors, I guess? Would be or does it, vary? it can oftentimes vary, but I'm going to say a lot of times you're going to notice it around five. The inattentive type. Yes is harder to track. So those are the kids that normally start to be called, like they seem lazy, they're always daydreaming, they don't seem to try that hard. Inattentive aren't behavioral issues, so they tend to fall under the radar. The H, those kids aren't falling under the radar. People know them, right? So you know the one that has the H because yeah. they're scudging, because yeah. they're breaking their pencil top, because they got up to go to the bathroom and they forgot where they were and they come back down, they sit back down, they're like, what was I doing? Right, that they have a hard time following sequential order of tasks. Mm -hmm. But the ADD, so without the hyperactivity, yeah. the inattentive type can oftentimes just be seen as struggling a little bit with school. Where you will see the higher prevalence is typically when school gets harder. So in middle school, you're gonna start noticing it a little bit more because they might not, and that's for both, they might not be able to complete their assignments, they might not be able to bring in their homework, you're like fighting over like, can't you just bring in your paper? When you start having those conversations, that's not an unreasonable task. So when it's their task that they continue to struggle with, you start going, hmm. Mm. I fall under the premise, every child wants to do well period. Kids stop trying when they feel their efforts don't work. Mm. And I say this a lot, kids would rather be bad than stupid. When you start thinking you don't know how to do better, 
that goes after who you are. And so I don't want to be stupid. So I don't want it. I don't care. You care about my homework. I don't care about my homework. When you can't bring it in, then you start paying attention. When you're just not getting it done, then you pay attention. When you forget to study for all of your exams, then you pay attention, right? But you'll see those signs typically around five. In the substance use field, and I just did a training, nobody should be getting diagnosed with ADHD in their first treatment, right? Early recovery looks like every single diagnosis you could have. And so it should be backtracked. You should be looking for signs, and oftentimes when you're sitting with families, and you start saying, what was it like when they went to school? How did they do in kindergarten? What were the things? That those that have higher functioning in regards to the behavioral modifications, those that maybe had the inattentive type, you'll see signs. Mm -hmm. So you go, oh yeah, that is a little bit different than the other ones. <laughs> that did happen like that, right? And you start putting the puzzle pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, I have a daughter with ADHD inattentive and she was diagnosed at five. Um, we struggled with some of the general education teachers um, mm. taking that seriously. And, yes. And I'm doing some, I'm trying to learn how to do some advocacy work, and that's some place that I really want to concentrate on. Yes. Because they get so little training. Sure. And there's the stigma and misdiagnosis and mm -hmm. underappreciation yeah. of children with ADHD, especially girls with inattentive ADHD. Correct. Correct. And so that's an interesting thing because somebody had asked once, why are there so many more girls? So these are objectives. That's what we're going to talk about, so I'm not going to talk about it, right? <clears throat> With girls in particular, it is less diagnosed. And so when they were saying, you know, is the prevalence, I don't know if the prevalence is really, you know, kind of operationally less or have we just studied it less? Yeah. in girls, right? So mm -hmm. right. research on brains has only been studied on women since the 90s, right? So we know that there's a little bit of a lag in trying to get everybody kind of a full understanding. And so I think symptoms that are less offensive are oftentimes less responded to. ADHD is a diagnosis that people are dismissive of. And so what they do is like, this is just an excuse or, and so in no means am I making excuses for anybody because that doesn't help the child. But setting up appropriate, and so I do go to schools, right? And that's okay, a big good. one is that I go to schools and meet with teachers and do all these different things because it is that important. And normally what I'll say is, so this is like an interesting quote, the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. Wow. And so here's a thought for a child who has ADHD, right? Inattentive or not that when they're sitting down and they are little, every five-year-old wants to do well, period. And so when they are sitting down and they're trying to do the best that they can, and they're squidging and they can't, and they get disciplined, and then you're like, you need to go sit down, stop moving around, you gotta go sit down, sit down. If you keep doing this, I'm gonna take your recess. Why don't you just try harder? Why don't you just stop what you're doing and sit down and try? If you just tried, you would be fine. It doesn't work like that. No. And here's the thing. With a diagnosis of ADHD that should be appropriately diagnosed, it is the equivalency of saying to a child who is blind, here is a book. Read it. Read it. Yeah. And when the child is like, I can't read it, and you're like, just sit down with the rest of the kids and read the book. I can't. You can if you tried. Just sit down and read the book. And what you start to see, which is what happens with kids with ADHD, the inattentive ones can sometimes get lost because they won't say anything back. And the hyper ones are gonna start becoming aggressive. Mm -hmm. Stop telling me what to do, you don't. So with that child, right? So there's only one, there's one of two directions that that child is going to go. It would be hard for a teacher single-handedly be able to differentiate that or whether the honestly the kid is just being a jerk I mean I yeah guess, I, but it's it's one of those things that you go yes and listen a few of my very best friends are teachers and we have this conversation a lot mm -hmm. but it's your job mm -hmm. we are in substance use we get cursed out we get chewed out, we get told to you know, get out of here, we get people cursing us out, saying that they don't even want this anymore, people get, and when staff and I go, and I know, 
And those are part of the trainings that I have to do, right? Come back into staff and say, I get it. And it's your job. Mm. And you can because validate anyway. It, yeah. It doesn't matter what the reason to validate the child. You don't yes. say, do this, and they say you can't. And you say, yes, you do. You know, you validate. You make them feel better about themselves. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just such yeah. a vicious thing, though, because you have teachers who have so, so much placed on them yeah. to do well themselves. Absolutely. I'm seeing it from all angles. And Absolutely. It's, it's just you can see how kids are getting lost in the yeah. Trouble. Yeah. And I think that as people become more educated, and teachers included, right? Yeah. So they're doing the best that they can, and I genuinely mean that. I have, uh, my, my sister was a preschool teacher for a very long time as well is the more that they understand it and they are given tools, right. they can start shifting it. Because when you grab a child, even whether the child is being bad or just displaying their inattentive tendencies, mm -hmm. the reality is that both can be addressed. Mm -hmm. And both can be, kids want to do well. And so I always say the investment is in their little. Mm -hmm. Because when they get to middle school and high school, they no longer care. They do, because everybody does. But that doesn't feel good. And so then they act out. And again, you're either acting out by taking something in, right? You're acting out when you lose your voice, you either swallowed it where depression sits, or you acted it out where aggression sits. And so the investment is in the little ones. Yes. The investment, I mean, I work with adolescents, so there's always investments. I'm not saying it doesn't. I got adults at RCA, so everybody's worth investing. But if we just shifted that culture when they were little, to really understand that whatever we're saying to these kids becomes their inner voice. It's who they, that's the story that they have. My daughter was sort of, I don't think it was real, when she was in kindergarten, but then she started getting pull, pulled out of class all the time. And I know they did the best they could, but then she ended up hating, she loved social life, but hating school. Sure. So, and I was the, graduated in 68 from high school, and I think I got something, I never got diagnosed, but how you feel about yourself. I don't even remember school. I blocked out everything, you know. But my daughter, who is only 32, um, in our system, which I think, I work in it, I, you know, there's good and bad. But our system certainly has a lot of special ed, a lot of stuff, you know, but I don't know what it was. She just really turned because she was pulled out in kindergarten right on and she, you know, yeah. I don't know how to do it really, it's hard. Yeah, and I think again, what we're speaking to is people's confidence, right? And so kids, yeah. when they start to hear different stories, they worry about it, and so how are we explaining it? How do we do it? Schools are doing it a little bit differently now, appreciating yeah. that kids about, are not wanting to get pulled. Yeah. Um, but the tricky part, again, for anybody that has a child with ADHD, is the reality is <clears throat> it's not, it doesn't meet criteria for special education. It's not a learning disability. So it actually becomes a little bit, because you get accommodations, and so sometimes that might be where some of this well, she falls in, right? So you have accommodations, but you don't have a learning disability. <coughs> Correct. So, but I think that, and I come from the same school system, but different <coughs> ages, I think that our teachers are taught to be teachers. Mm -hmm. They're not taught to have any, um, human services skills as it relates to a child who has Tourette's as well as ADHD and a learning disability. Yeah. And so... It's a dark one. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, being an advocate for, you know, don't tell me that, okay, it's on his IEP, this, this, and this, but... You guys are teachers, and you're banging your hands on the table saying, do this work. Well, guess what? He's not going <clears> to, <throat> and I'm not going to make him until you guys support him in the right way. Yeah. Believe me. Thank God he's out of the school system. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, yes. again, that's kind of, this is the conversation. Advocacy is important, understanding it, so the more you know, the better advocate you are. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be, you know, really transparent is that I do fundamentally believe the teachers are trying the best they can but if they haven't been taught how to do some of this and that's you know are there bad teachers of course there are there's bad sure, no. therapists right? right that we all exist well I, I'm not saying I'm the bad therapist right <laughs> so not me right no I'm one of the good guys right no I'm one of the good guys but they all exist in any profession 
So I think, again, it's how to advocate, you know, how to understand the disorder and in a way that would allow for appropriate um, ways to help. And I think we're moving in that direction. I think people know more today. I think people understand a little bit more in regards to this. And there is accountability, right, that they have to have accommodations and then follow through with them. And that's where advocacy becomes important because it might be up to you guys to make sure that those accommodations are being honored. And then yep. the medication comes in. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about the medication. Okay. So what you're saying now is that ADHD is more of a medical diagnosis, and so it's not necessarily something that's taught. It's not to the teachers. Like, they don't think it's a learning disability, and therefore it's not taught to them to be able to recognize something like that because it's more of a medical issue? So it is a viable diagnosis, right? So it's as a result of physiological changes in the brain, right? And so we know that for a fact because we have enough scans on brains to identify the differences within the scan, the brain activity. I think that the symptoms, and so when we look at the symptoms, you know, and we'll touch on it for a second, but I feel like most people know what the symptoms are. When you look at the symptoms of ADHD, it can be disruptive, except for the child that's inattentive, in which case nobody's paying attention to them, so they didn't know that they just didn't pay attention to the last 45 minutes, right? When you get to high school and you have block scheduling, yes. stop it, right? Okay. Block scheduling, you've got an 80 minute class for math and the inattentive child stopped paying attention after 10 minutes. So then when it circles back around, they're like, I have no idea where we are, right? And so the teachers are trying to control the classroom, right? They have a lot of kids in there. And so it's finding the more effective ways, just like trauma, right? You can't discipline a child with trauma in the same capacities because they're responding to it differently, right? And so for ADHD, it's giving and helping them understand what's going to work for kids with ADHD. Again, for my daughter, she has ADHD. She's been involved in sports since the time that she was three. She came home to me every day. And so behaviorally, I could schedule her in ways that I knew could work mm -hmm. until high school, in which case I was like, I can't do that in high school because they're gonna be 80 minute blocks. She can't pay attention for that long, right? And so it's just getting teachers to be more familiar with what works. Right, chaos increases symptoms. So when there's chaos at home or if there's chaos in the class, the symptoms get worse. And so it's just helping and I think that's really where the movement is. I mean, you know, with substance use, with mental health, all of those things, we're moving in a direction of understanding how to, to handle things better in a way that's more supportive to reduce the vulnerabilities and risks of the future. That's kind of for me ADHD. There's risks and vulnerabilities, people should be aware of them. Because without it, people can fall and people still can right but you have some different ways of arming people with the right information to help reduce those risks ADHD because people think that it's nothing because it's a stigma because people are minimizing it it isn't really talked about and so if it's not talked about I'm a big fan of saying this and I say this all the time people create their own narratives if nobody gives them one so if your child has ADHD and nobody's had a conversation continuously, because I hardly listen to you, right? So you're going to get a couple minutes in. If you're not having these continuous conversations, there's a narrative going on in their head of who they are that's associated with this and what they can and can't accomplish, right? If they do or don't get in trouble, if they are or not smart, right? And, oh my gosh, that's my computer. I got to plug it in. Um, I guess so. <laughs> scared me. Um, Thank you. It sure does. It yells at you to let you know. I'm about to die. Yeah. So when we're looking at it, and again, this is some of the myths. This is why some people don't take it seriously. It's overdiagnosed. It is. Here's why it's mostly overdiagnosed. Because there's a lot of trauma in this world with a lot of little children. And they have been misdiagnosed with ADHD. And so the treatment would be very, very different, right? One is about safety and one is executive functioning. And so both are real, but they look similar, but they are treated differently in a lot of ways, right? And so it is overdiagnosed. I don't think, and people have said that, do you think that now ADHD, it's because people are watching TV and we have kids inside and they're not playing? No, and this is a genetic 
disorder. We notice this within families. There's a high level of you know, genetic vulnerability that increases the likelihood of this. But do you notice it more if you contain somebody? <laughs> yes. So if, if I use my daughter, and she's given me full permission, we've had this conversation many a times, right? If I were to use my daughter, if I contained her inside our house, her symptoms get worse because she's sitting inside my house bored. If she's out all day, I don't see the symptoms as much because she's exerted herself, right? She's played soccer, she's got lacrosse, she's doing running, she's doing things. So being today's technology did not increase the likelihood of ADHD, it probably increased our visual acuity on it. We see it more because kids can't sit still, right? It is not an excuse for bad behavior, but it is an understanding of it. So it shouldn't be excusing it. We can't excuse people's behaviors, but we don't need to shame them, right? Shame makes you, shame goes inside the story of who you are, saying this is who you are, right? So I'm not afraid of saying that. This is a conversation that we've had many a times with my daughter. I'm like, you got ADHD. I don't know what you want to talk, like this is what you got. So you're gonna have to write a list. <laughs> Like we can have this fight again, but or you can write the list, put it in your room, and we're gonna call it a day. And so it's not to shame the behaviors, but it is a recognition of like, would we be having this conversation if I told you you needed a pair of glasses? No? So then we need to stop having this conversation because this is what you have. No big deal. Only hyper kids have it. We've already discussed that. The inattentive type is also gonna be. Bad parenting causes ADHD, so that is that was once upon a time. We always like to blame the parents, right? So if you have bipolar, it was because you did something. If you have ADHD, it's, you might have a genetic predisposition to it, so it could be in your family. Bad parenting doesn't cause ADHD. I will say ADHD can cause bad parenting, right? And so you are not always your best self. <laughs> I think it can, it can pull things out of us in ways that we didn't know possible, but chaos does increase the symptoms. So if there's a lot of anger, if there's a lot of chaos inside the house as a result of it, and this is why families should be involved if they have a, a child that's been diagnosed, because if there's chaos and if there's a lot of anger, it increases their symptoms, but it's not caused by it. And if they tried harder, so here's a very interesting thing for all of us, and every time I do this training, I have people come up to me afterwards and they're like, oh my gosh, I think I just screwed up my kids. I've been saying this for years. So here's the thing, kids are resilient, right? And that when we learn something new, then we do something new, right? And we can change it and we can have conversations, right? I've done these same things, even though I've been doing this for 25 years. If they just tried harder, and we say that a lot, the reality is that for the brain of somebody with ADHD, what happens is it shuts it down. Mm -hmm. So the activity that normally motivates, right? So the daughter that I don't have that has, does not have ADHD, if I was like, if you just tried a little harder, this could really happen. She's like, yeah, 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 yeah. If I just, I'm gonna do these things. And you'd see it motivate her. Mm -hmm. The child with ADHD, that what it does to the chemistry of the brain is it actually overwhelms it and so it stops it. So when we say to a child with ADHD, if you just tried harder, if you've said that to a child with ADHD, you actually see it. Because they either get really defiant, which is the deflection, right? I can't handle this because the inner voice is coming at me. But it shuts them down because they don't know how to try harder. <laughs> and so you're asking something of them. You're actually telling that child that can't see to read the, to read the book. And so it isn't about telling a child to try harder, it's identifying where do you see them needing to do something different. We have all said this. So if any of you have a child with ADHD and you're like, oh my gosh, I've totally screwed them all up, right? She's 23, here she is, she's still alive, right? <laughs> she's still around. <laughs> as delightful as possible, rip roaring ADHD. And I've said that before I knew. And now I know, so I don't. Now I say, what do we need to do? How do we need to figure this out? Because she's 23, she's not done developing, right? So that's the other piece too. So here are some of the facts. 52% of untreated abuse drugs and alcohol. That's half. This is why it's so crazy to me that in the substance use world, people aren't talking about this. It's literally half. 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 Untreated. Untreated. So you can have ADHD and you can treat it. And hopefully it'll be that, yeah. Correct. When you say treat, are you talking Medicaid or therapy or behavior or oh. all of it? Correct. Any and or, right? So not all, ADHD is a spectrum disorder. 
So you don't have either ADHD, everybody looks the same, or you don't, right? It's on a continuum. And so some kids do require medication. I'm actually for it. I work in a substance use field. I'm aware of what stimulants are. I know they are addicting. I also know that to date, there is no research that hasn't said when they are properly medicated, their reduction of a substance use disorder occurs. They are less likely to abuse. And so when somebody was like, well, my kids did abuse the substances. And I'm like, were they already abusing substances, though? Because if you became addicted to something, alcohol or marijuana, marijuana is huge for kids with ADHD. So when they become addicted to that, then they're going to abuse anything. That's called addiction. So then they might abuse their stimulant. But if they're not abusing anything else, the prevalence of kids abusing their ADHD medication is low and it lowers their risk of a substance use disorder because they are properly treated. But that's a very important distinction. So if they are already abusing substances and if people in here are saying, I don't care about marijuana, I don't say that, nor do I believe in it. But if they're abusing subs marijuana, I would not be giving them their stimulant because I'm not trying to give them anything that's going to increase vulnerabilities for substance use disorder because I work in substance use and that's not the path I want anybody. Right, I see it. I have a question. Um, my daughter takes Adderall, mm -hmm. and she takes a, you know, a reasonable dose. I was worried as we went on to the Adderall, I, said, I asked her psychi psychiatrist, and we believe, is she going to get addicted to Adderall based sure. on this dose? And she said that she wouldn't because she has the ADHD, so the way that it works with their brain, it is not addictive. So I, I see what you're saying. It'd be like if they went above their dose and started being yeah. So it's giving their brain exactly what it's supposed to. Yes. So that's where it does, it's like pain pills, right? When you have been in excruciating pain and you take an opioid, you're less vulnerable to the addiction because it's doing to your body what it's supposed to do. When the pain is no longer at the high level that it was and you're still taking it, boop, addiction creeps in, right? And so Adderall is the same, but if she started drinking a lot, if she started using marijuana, then she's more likely to start abusing sure. the Adderall, right? but it's reduced because it's doing to the brain what it's supposed to do. But people are nervous, mm -hmm. right? And so when you go off to college, you're like, hide your Adderall, don't tell people you have ADHD, right? Because people will break into your dorm, and they'll steal it, right? It's a federal crime if you give somebody Adderall, right? All these conversations that you're like, oh my God, you're so impulsive, right? Please make the right decision. But those are some of the things, right? So yeah, high school is a great time to have a conversation because in high school, they don't want to take their medication anymore, <laughs> right? makes me not hungry, some of these things I'm, I don't really want it anymore, or they started experimenting with weed. And weed will change the others. And so when you were saying, what about like behavioral interventions? I think they are necessary. The medication is to allow for somebody to integrate the skills to be able to use. So to me, you know, unless you have the skills and you've been working with them, the skills are equally as important to the medication because otherwise it's like giving somebody insulin but not giving them a nutritionist to understand how their diet is impacting the insulin. And so you would want that. It doesn't mean that they need, when I see a kid for ADHD, it's delightful because it's not really therapy in all honesty. It's really interventions. You know, family, I gotta change their expectations and help them to go after the symptoms, but I'm not really doing therapy. We're not talking about feelings because there's nothing worse than a, for a child with ADHD to sit around and talk about their feelings. They don't want to. <laughs> Plus you only have them for a good solid five or 10 minutes <laughs> before they start scudging, right? But the behavioral interventions are incredibly important and I think that's what happens is that they've been taking this medication since they were seven, but they've never been given the skills. And so in high school when it gets harder, because it's supposed to, those same kids who are creating a narrative from when they were younger think it's them. It's not you. There's skills you need. Mm -hmm. There's study habits that we need to help you with. There's this <clears throat> scaffolding on organizational skills and, and lists and using your cell phone. Everything, yeah. yeah. Now you're actually building the skills. And without the medication, they won't retain it. But with the medication, they can actually digest some of the skills. And they're really good about learning through their mistakes. So when they make a mistake, Instead of creating the craziness, okay, so then what do we want to do next? And we're going to talk about why that's so important when we talk about that, the brain, right? Is that you want them to really be thinking of like, so what next? These are not kids that do great with like, do this, bam, 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 bam. 
because what it doesn't do is activate the part of their brain that helps them to think critically and that part of the brain already is lacking. So we have to help them get to that thinking part because they're emotionally, they're using more of the emotional brain. And so when they're just doing these things, what we find for a lot of kids with ADHD is they get incredibly good at lying. Mm -hmm. So good. <laughs> because they know they keep getting into trouble. So I just duck lower because I'm still going to screw up. I'm not done. I think something, and I'll be fast, sorry. Um, I think a good 504 plan or a good IEP, mm -hmm. building in those accommodations that are thoughtful, that I think that can really, really help. Mm -hmm. I still think, <laughs> I, I still think what you said, therapy is, I think it should be both. But I think you could at least make some end roads. Yeah. Know. And sometimes I think when we say kids have to go to therapy. Yeah, my daughter won't. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to therapy. You're not going to therapy. I'm, I need you. You can find people that actually specialize in ADHD, where it's skill-based. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about their feelings, and there's not necessarily things that they have to talk about, <laughs> but they need some skills. And so it's really just that. It's kind of just building skills. So when you're saying it, you probably don't need to use the word therapy. They might not need therapy. Your family might not need therapy. You just might need some help building some skills for a child so that they can succeed, and so that the family learns how to respond to them so that they don't get caught in the wrong cycle. Because yeah, normally the families get caught in the chaos, which perpetuates it. Because mm -hmm. they're normally going after when they keep falling down, right? And so again, when we're looking, this is really just to highlight the risks. This is why it's important for us to take this seriously. Oops. So here's the truth. Less than half of those are being treated. One of the most common disorders with the greatest risks. And this has been around for 35 years. This isn't new, right? This isn't trending. This isn't like all of a sudden because kids are on their cell phones or kids are on their computers that now we have ADHD. We're better equipped at ident identifying things. I think it was there long before 30. Yeah, and I think when you think about people generations ago, you were like, oh, I don't know why Uncle Sally, you know, Uncle Bob didn't make it. He dropped out of high school. He didn't do, you go, ah. Oh. Uncle Bob's like so crazy, so fun. He's like always the one that's like, let's go under the car, right? So when you start having these conversations, it wasn't diagnosed. But they were likely didn't finish college or high school, right? They might have found a trade that they were really good at. They're probably really good with their hands. People probably really enjoyed being around them. People with ADHD are like, they're almost charismatic. Like you enjoy. Obviously, I married somebody, I didn't even know it. Right? And so it's one of those things that in my brain, I'm like, what the hell has happened to me? <laughs> so I chose a career with ADHD. I married somebody, didn't even know he had it until after I had my daughter and was like, how the hell does she have ADHD? Uh -huh. How did this happen? Right? How did we get here? And three of my best friends have ADHD. <laughs> psychologists, another therapist. Wow. So I love the energy of it, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I'm in a good position of being around it because I actually do appreciate it. Not all the time, right? Because it's <laughs> frustrating to raise. But I can appreciate it. And so it's been around. It is nothing new. That's just kind of perpetuating that stigma. And so in all honesty, I say this to every person that I work with, it's a superpower. ADHD actually is. But with all good superpowers, it's either going to be for evil or for good. And so you have to choose which. And if you don't choose one, it will choose you. This is not a diagnosis you can ignore. ADHD will not be ignored. It will either run you or you will run it. It is one or the other. So when people are like, ah, I got ADHD, I can do this on my own, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure about that. And so it will rear its head in one way or another. Right? The higher H is obviously behavioral. You're going to see those different things. The inattentive, you're going to just notice that the grades are going to start changing. They're going to start having a little, a little more like apathy. This is where you see depression because they don't really know why they're not doing well. I don't really understand what's happening to me. And so you'll see it depending on the symptoms. But they are incredibly intelligent. They are oftentimes like the CEOs of companies, <laughs> the high rates of those that have been diagnosed with ADHD. Because if you think about it, your brain is a muscle and theirs is in the gym all the time. Problem is that if you go to the gym every day and you only work out your arms, your legs are really skinny. And so the parts of the brain that they're working out all the time are more of the emotional part of the brain and we need them to work out the cortex. Mm -hmm. 
And that's where those conversations, so I can be very kind of militant to my one daughter and she'll do whatever I have to say and then she might be angry and she'll suck it up and she'll do it. But if I were to do that with the child with ADHD, I will actually not be triggering her cortex. And I need her to work her cortex because she's in the gym all the time, but she's only working out the limbic system. <laughs> and so I need the better balance. She needs to crossfit. She needs to crossfit, right, <laughs> exactly. So how do you do that? That's those conversations, uh -huh. right? They're going to make mistakes, and so it's the hardest thing for a parent to accept, including myself, right? So I'm still a parent, but my goal is always the same, and I wanna reduce risks. I hate to say that, but I'm in the substance use world, so I want to reduce risks associated with it. And so that's always been kind of my goal. And so there's a lot of like, so here's, the, here's what happened, and now what are we going to do? So how do we do this differently this next time? Because a part of the brain that doesn't help is that they, they get A and B. They don't get how A, B, and C connect. Mm -hmm. And so having them have to do some of the work, not when you're angry, but when it has calmed down to say, so what do we need to, like, what do you think you need to do differently? There was a phrase I used to say all the time. I would say it with all my kids, but you can make a good decision in the middle of a bad one. So you can have done something that you were like, gosh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. And in that decision, be like, but I'm gonna do this so it doesn't get worse. Mm -hmm. Trying to connect A, B, and C. Don't get caught in just that one spot and so yeah they're incredibly fun and spontaneous that's why like people like being around them right who wants to jump off a bridge i do who wants to go for a hike i will who wants to do right you get that super hyper one too they're going to do a little bit of everything <laughs> and so again i always can say are you the one that jumps into the fire without thinking that's inattentive or impulsive when you go, are you the one that afterwards you're like, oh, that was such a stupid decision. Then you're like, oh, that might be teetering on that idea. And they will know it almost immediately. When you say something like that, they're like, no, that's me. That's not even the hyperactive. That's just the lack of thinking through. So when we are saying, which is inherent of adolescence, period, with adolescence with ADHD, it's a little bit more. So they're inherently going to take more risks. But for the child with ADHD, it's even greater. This is what puts them at higher risk and vulnerability for other, right. And so this is an executive decision. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. The good news is that they tend to be some of our heroes because in order to be in the military, in order to be a police officer or a firefighter or any of these high risk, they have to be able to be willing to and accept risk as a part of their physiology. And so we do see that a lot, right? So again, why I say that is because I need those kids to know that there's a lot of really valuable things about having this. That this isn't a curse, this is a gift. But you've got to manage it. Because if you don't manage it, it's going to manage you. And so this is... And that I need them because their narrative is saying this is the worst thing. I'm stupid, I work too hard, I'm not doing anything, people, I keep getting in trouble. Whatever that story is, I need them to hear this is a genuine superpower. Whatever you decide you want, you're actually going to be able to get because you have the ability to do so. It's just you can't figure out how to get there. That we can figure out. That is super helpful and so being involved and so I wrote that down like success is best when highly stimulated so when the brain is stimulated so when people are worried about like sports and all that stuff they tend to do their best because their brain is chronically being stimulated so they actually could play two sports and then go home and get their homework done and show back up at school because their brain is being stimulated the whole time a bored brain is a bad brain mm -hmm. and their brain can get bored easier and so if anybody remembers with Michael Phelps, who does have ADHD, I'm not diagnosing him, he said it, right? And he was prescribed medication when he was little. When he stopped training, does anybody remember what happened? He was, because that when he was smoking pot. Yeah. He started smoking weed, right? Yeah, he started smoking weed and got DUIs and went into rehab. No history. Mm -hmm. Highly engaged brain. Training. Stop training. Bored brain impulsive, DUI, started smoking weed, ended up in treatment. So those are things, again, that you can have conversations about, not threats, because it doesn't work, especially with kids with ADHD, but where you say, this is, 
you know, you got to figure out things that you like. A bored brain is not a great brain for somebody. It makes it harder for them to study. It makes them harder to continue to succeed. So being busy is good for them. Being stimulated is good for them. So here are some of the sides, the signs of ADHD. I'm gonna go through some of these slides so I can be respectful of everybody's time and make sure that I'm not keeping everybody too long. So the signs, we've all seen these things with in short attention spans and easily distracted, right? <laughs> but as they get older, the vulnerabilities and the impulsive behaviors become more of a threat to the adults that love them. They were equally, right? They were the kid that was jumping off the couch. They were the one that was like playing by themselves. They were engaging in some of the same behaviors, but when they get older, they become higher risk. It's a similar kind of behavior. It's just that it's as they're older, what they can get involved in is more dangerous. And so the way that we respond can also help in creating a conversation about what to do different. Because the reality is that they can't see everything they're about to do either. So there's less predictability, right? And I remember saying that a lot. I'm like, I can't, in a billion years, I wouldn't have thought that was about, that's what you would have done. <laughs> like, I can't think that way. I don't know some of the things that are around the corner because I don't even know how to think like that. So I wouldn't have known to say, like warn you, because I couldn't have thought that. And so it isn't about that as much as, so then what do you have to do a little different the next time because this is some of the risks. So this is criteria, nobody cares, right? Core issues with ADHD, this becomes incredibly important because these are all skills, particularly when we're talking about substance use, but even going off to college. So these are the core issues with ADHD. This is why for those of you that have kids, I'm gonna say make sure you're having conversations before they go to college because accommodations do a really good job of keeping them in high school, but when they go to college, accommodations are based on them yeah. showing up and asking for them at 18. Most kids don't, and so they have one of the higher rates of dropping out. So doing incredibly well in high school, and again, always keep in mind that inner voice to the child's narrative, right? So they did really well in high school because when they are structured, when they understand it, and so the structuring is important, but the conversation for them to understand why the structuring is there so that they can figure out how to take that with them. Because otherwise it's really structured in high school and I teach at a university, there's nothing I can do. Once they come there, it, you've got three tests. If you fail a couple of tests in high school, you've got six during a year, you can pull yourself back out of a, a hole. In college, you have three. If you fail one, it's hard to get out of the hole. And so those are, again, conversations about organizational skills. That's that piece of medication isn't going to give them that. But it will open up their brain to understanding how these will work as a conversation. So I'm going to go over the brain a little bit. And again, I'm going to try and move through this so that I don't keep you too long. But when we're looking at the brain of ADHD, here are some of the key components. The frontal lobes is where executive functioning occurs. <clears throat> this is the part, and so when I talk about these transmitters, and I'm not trying to be over sciency, but sciency enough that it makes sense, <laughs> this is why trauma and ADHD are two different things, because trauma is sitting inside the nervous system, right? Because it's a, an issue regarding safety and hypervigilance. This is executive functioning. This is why Adderall would prescribe, but imagine being really, really scared or really, really anxious and somebody giving you 15 cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. That's trauma. Mm -hmm. So here we have little kids that have trauma and we're giving them a stimulant. Mm, yeah. So behaviors get worse. Mm -hmm. For a child that has ADHD, when you give them a stimulant, you're gonna be like, huh, huh. <laughs> and they're gonna be like, I just finished like a whole page. I just read a whole page. And so that's what you'll see is the difference. If you gave a child that didn't have ADHD a stimulant, they'd be wired. <laughs> they'd be like, wow, look at me. This is why college kids are abusing stimulants because it's keeping them up all night. If you actually have ADHD, it will not keep you up all night <laughs> yes. because it just activates the part of the brain to say, stay focused. Get rid of all the external noises. Listen to the lecture. 
write your notes. And so that's the executive functioning and the neurotransmitters, which we'll talk about, that's what needs to be done. There are less of certain chemicals in the brain than there would be for somebody else, right? That the cerebellum, I'm not even gonna go into that because some of this I have in there because of substance use, but the limbic system, which is basically where they are sitting. The limbic system is the emotional center for your brain. And so when we're looking at how to understand the kids, the executive functioning, this behaves automatically. These are day-to-day -day functions. That when your brain starts to register, this is what you're supposed to do. For somebody with ADHD, those day-to-day -day tasks don't become a part of it, so they don't necessarily follow through. So if you've had a child that you say, why don't you go get dressed, run upstairs, grab your backpack, come on downstairs, and grab your lunchbox and meet me in the car. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's not happening. That those automatics, nothing is automatic. <laughs> so they went upstairs, you're like, what's taking them so long? 15 minutes, they come downstairs, you're like, where's your backpack? What? Where's your, where's your lunchbox? <laughs> yeah, and, they, and you're like, what were you doing for 15 minutes? And they were like, playing. Yeah. I got in my room, I saw a toy, so I started playing with the toy, and you're like, Oh my gosh, right? You still have to go get your backpack. I need you to brush your teeth. Forget the teeth, right? So all of those executive functioning. And so again, there's two ways for a child to perceive that. Either through, what did I just tell you? Go and get that, which is that it doesn't matter what I do. I'm not going to do it right. Or, dude, you just totally forgot your backpack again. <laughs> like how many times do we need to do this? Why don't we put a chart at the front door? and then you check it off, because I don't want to. If you go into my house on any given day, I know exactly what my daughter has eaten, because the drawers that she got the bowl from is open, <laughs> the cabinets are open, I know where the cereal was, that's still there, the box is still there, there's a very good chance the milk is still out, right? All of those things. That's so true. And so I know that's her brain, and so I can get angry at it, which would be shaming her, and again, we do it, so I'm not saying that we're not going to, right? So we're still parents, we're gonna shame sometimes. Not always intentionally. Or I can just say, I mean, it looks like I got, I know what you had. And now I'm going to say, but you do have to close everything. <laughs> because if I come around and I close it for her, nothing has triggered. Right? No. No, you're right. right? There's nothing learned. And so I don't have to make fun of it to be like, I literally just saw what you had for breakfast. <laughs> and the milk is still sitting out. When did you eat, an hour ago or is this two hours ago? Yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, you gotta go back around, you gotta close everything back up. That it's now something funny as like, so this is what ADHD is, versus, oh God, why am I always screwing up? You're not, this is just what it is. That's a part of the executive functioning. Just doesn't think about it, doesn't matter. I always say it's like thrown in the back of their burning closet. If it's not a priority, it doesn't occur. And so when there's tasks that you can say, listen, you gotta clean the kitty litter, you gotta do the trash, whatever you're going to say, they're going to say, I'll do it later. Mm. Let them, yeah, and then let them. And then when it doesn't happen, then you're able to either get angry, but when you don't do it or you do it yourself, you get angry. Yes, yes. When you just follow back up and you're like, so are we agreeing this is not gonna happen unless you do it now? Like there's no shot I think you're gonna remember to do that in a half hour. So why don't you just do it now and then you come back and then we don't have to fight about this later. <laughs> then they know, they're like, nah, because they'll agree. No, there is no shot. I'm not gonna remember that in a half hour. <laughs> There's no shot. I'm gonna watch TV, I'm gonna get on my game, I'm gonna be on my cell phone. There's no shot I'm gonna remember in a half hour. So then it's skills, not punishment, right? And so that's all that idea, that complex problem solving. That's a skill that needs to be developed it isn't inherent. And so that's all executive functioning. When we talk about the limbic system, this is why the reactions are so strong. So the limbic system for all adolescents, this is why people don't always like being around adolescents, <laughs> right? Because they're sitting in their limbic system. It's the emotional center of the brain. So they're more easily triggered. They don't really think through the consequences of their decisions, right? All of these things that are inherently limbic system and emotional, that's where they predominantly sit when you have ADHD, you're sitting here a little bit more because the cortex isn't being as triggered. It's not being as activated, right? That's where they're more easily frustrated. This is also where somebody's gonna have a lot more negative thoughts. 
about themselves, right? So they're going to start controlling the narrative in a way that makes themselves look bad. And so having those kind of things, it's difficult for them to pick up. This is common with parents as well. And schools, they don't pick up on the, the cues. So because they're sitting in that, so when a, a peer might be annoyed at them, or if you're mad at them, or you're kind of like, you didn't see that I was looking at you? And they're like, no. And you're like, were you not even looking at me? And they're like, I was looking at you. I don't even know what you're talking about. That level of acuity where they're picking up on the perceptions of what you're trying to give to them isn't concrete. Parenting is kind of about that, right? You gotta pick up on my cues and I'm like giving you the stink eye. Those kids don't pick that up. And so we are oftentimes then frustrated. But it's a part of the diagnoses. So this looks terrible, but it isn't. So this is just measuring the dopamine, right? So dopamine, again, here's the vulnerability in regards to substance use. Dopamine is the pleasure reward center. That's what's released when you engage in substance use. And so this has nothing to do, I just told you that ADHD is a superpower and they are incredibly bright. It's showing you the level of activity of dopamine. So for somebody that has no ADHD, dopamine is appropriate. It's released, so when they do things that are normal, so if I you know, drive somewhere beautiful, I might release dopamine because I'm like, wow, that's really pretty, right? I, I've done different things and maybe not so exciting things that my brain rewards me and says, wow, that was terrific. Why a child with ADHD has higher risks for behaviors is because they have less dopamine. So it needs more excitement to get the same effect as a cupcake or a beautiful fall tree might give to me. I see a beautiful fall tree, I literally was like, I'm gonna go take a picture. I'm gonna walk in the parking lot and take a picture. That's so pretty, I'm so excited. That was enough dopamine for me to be like, that's eh, okay. Somebody with ADHD might be like, hold on, I'm gonna go run across the street. The picture is gonna be better. Let me run across the street, let me run down this hill and I'm gonna take it, because they need more. Mm -hmm. That's the impulsivity. That's the thrill seeking. Not because they're punks, not because they just want to do it, but because it takes a little bit more for them to find that excitement, right? So they seek the thrill. Jumping out of an airplane, swimming with sharks, right? All those things, doing these things because it's more stimulating to the brain. For substances, and again, having conversations with kids at a very young age of saying, listen, if you start using drugs, your brain is going to lit up like fireworks. Your brain is not the same as anybody else's and you run different risks. Because my brain might be like, oh, I get it. Your brain is gonna light up like fireworks. Because you have a different and you will need more to get it. That's the conversation. And never changes that. Mm. Doesn't matter how old you get, you still, you still don't get enough and yeah. you want more. Correct. Mm. And so you start finding things, yeah, that you can find that are, you know, exciting enough or things that are stimulating. The gym is fantastic for anybody with ADHD. It's terrific for everybody, right? But not all of us love going to the gym. But for somebody that has ADHD, it actually is. And for exercise, they've done enough research that said it's almost as good as the placebo of exercise is almost the equivalency of a stimulant. Really? Because it is so exciting to the brain. Right, that it is releasing endorphins, it's a releasing adrenaline, it's releasing all of these great chemicals that the stimulants are trying to do as well. That's why for a lot of kids, we're like, exercise before you study. If you told me to exercise before I study, there's no shot I would study. I would come home very begrudgingly and I would probably go to sleep. For somebody with ADHD, they exercise right before they study. It stimulates their brain and they actually can focus. And so here are those chemicals, and that's kind of where I'm going to end it. The rest of it kind of goes into substance use, but I can mention the medications, which we had talked about. So these three are some of the key. There's a lot of them that are involved, obviously, but these are three, and these are the three that are also kind of override in regards to substance use. But norepinephrine, lower levels decrease your ability to sustain focus on a task, right? Plan ahead and understands concepts such as sequence and time. So if you leave at five, and you have to be at your interview at six, you're never gonna get there. And they're like, yes, I can. You're like, it's not gonna happen. No, I'm totally gonna get there on time. And you're like, how do you see that working out? Because I'm worried that that is not gonna happen at all. That that piece, <laughs> it's like, they're, they're like, no, I can. And when they walk through it, 
You're like, so how long would it take you to get to the actual car? And they're like, uh, 10 minutes. Great. And then how long do you think you're going to be on the highway? 30 minutes. So we're at 40 minutes right now. You have to be inside by in an hour? Yeah. They're still not connecting all of it. Right? So that's a part of it. That is just a lower level of norepinephrine. That helps you to stay alert. Right? It helps you to stay attentive, to be like, this is what I need to do to navigate it. And lower levels decrease that ability. OK, so we know that. So then we have to do it. Dopamine, those are increases in your risk behaviors, your impulsivity, because that is seeking rewards. That is why somebody is more likely to engage in behaviors, because they have lower levels of dopamine. And again, when there's substance use, and so when we talk about how we need to reduce the stigma, somebody that ends up using substances as a result of having ADHD, that wasn't just somebody being impulsive and stupid. That was somebody that when they engaged in having a substance, it actually made them feel as good as it does when I have a cupcake. They felt better. That makes sense. And if they don't understand it, and they can't figure out ways to do it on their own because nobody's taught them, then they don't. And they'll always revert back to what the brain has told them has worked. And so there's no judgment there. I get it, but we got to figure out a different way. The serotonin, which affects their mood, sleep, aggression, and shifting attention. So when there's lower levels, and again, when you are given a stimulant, it is increasing these chemicals within their brain to allow for somebody to access that executive functioning that they can stay on task, that they can think through the consequences of their choices, and that they can start to learn the skills. Medication does not teach you skills, though. It does not give you organizational skills. It doesn't give you how to understand cell phones, right? So when they're like, I was just on my cell phone, and then I come back to my test, you're like, how did that work? <laughs> because shifting attention, so when I'm on my cell phone, because somebody just texted me, and then I shift back to the book, they are like starting back at the beginning of the page. Somebody else might be able to just shift back to the line. And so you go, listen, you've got to pay attention to that. When you're going to college, pay attention. Because if you go out to a party on a Thursday night and you have a test on Friday, that has dramatically changed your brain. You're not going to perform as well. Somebody else might. You need to give your brain at least two to three days to relax. Because it's too stimulating. So I'm not going to tell a child when they go to college, so I need you not to go to parties anymore, because then they're going to literally be like, so we're not going to have a conversation ever again. Mm -hmm. Right? We're done. And so then it's really, here's skills. This is what will happen. Do you want to do well? So it's skills. It's not all or nothing. It's skills. And that becomes important. And again, GABA, which is decreased inside their brain, helps to calm it. They don't have enough of it. These are the important factors. So I'm going to skip over the substance use. That's all substance use. Behavioral interventions. These are some of the behavioral interventions. They don't necessarily need therapy, again, as I said, unless they do, right? But not because they have ADHD. Somebody having ADHD doesn't necessarily require therapy. But if it goes untreated for a long time and then they start to experience depression or anxiety, then they might. Because now they've got a different narrative that's taken a toll on their their person. Diet and nutrition make a huge difference. Exercise makes a huge difference. Helping when they're little, getting families involved because families can change the way. So again, I always say, here's how you know a kid with ADHD is academics. They do that and then they start to plummet. And then everybody gets really like, oh my gosh, you're not doing well. What's happening? That's super exciting to a brain. And so a brain gets really, really excited and then all of a sudden they start doing well again. And then their brain gets bored. And it starts to drop, and then the teachers call. The portal system is a freaking nightmare, right? Because everybody can check it all the time. And I'm like, who's? So I have three children, and I've said to teachers, I'm not ever checking their portal. Because I'm teaching them that if they need my help, they have to, te they have to come to me. Because otherwise, I'm, I don't say all this, right? They don't need to know all my business, right, with the teachers. But otherwise, I'm reinforcing the wrong thing to their brain. If a parent comes to me and says, I'm going to check their portals, I'm like, then can you bring the child with you? And you guys look at it and say, what do we need to do? But when a parent checks it, they're normally like, why isn't your stuff in? Why didn't you turn that in? Where is it? What did you do? And that is overstimulating to the brain for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to college one day, and you will not have access to a portal. And they will not have access to getting that brain stimulated in the way that you do every time you yell at them. There's the up and down of their grades. Whatever their top is, is actually their capability. Yeah. 
So the beauty is that when they get to the top, you're like, that's actually how smart you are. <laughs> you didn't get dumb. What happened is your board, your brain got bored. So your grades dipped and then people got angry and started yelling and screaming and they're like, you gotta get everything together. And then your brain got super excited and back to the top. That's also not conducive to college, but they need to learn skills. And so when you start saying, that's where you might be like, why don't we just talk to somebody that can give you skills? You don't need therapy, but you might need skills because you don't have to hit the bottom. But you might need some structure and organizational skills to keep you steady. That's a very big difference. But that is the cycle of a lot of kids with ADHD. And honestly, that's almost a weed out for me. As soon as I say that, I'm like, is this your grades? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, okay, so have you been diagnosed with ADHD? Because that's what it feels like we're already starting at. Because nobody wants the bottom. But their brain, their bored brain is going to hit the bottom. That's what they're saying, I'm really good at procrastinating. You're not, your brain just gets overly stimulated when people start yelling and screaming at you. <laughs> your brain doesn't care why it's stimulated, it just is. And a stimulated brain is incredibly effective, <laughs> i.e. Michael Phelps, right? So they've got to stay tar start taking that kind of responsibility. But the portal system, and for those of you that are checking the portal system, I'm not judging it. I'm not judging you for doing it. If you have a child with ADHD, I would make it more of a conversation than it is behind the scenes because it normally will get you angry and then you'll come at them and that's stimulating the wrong part for them. So create a conversation of like, let's sit down every Monday, we'll go over it together and we'll figure out what we need to do different. But the scream of behind the scenes is normally gonna just trigger the, the brain activity and they're only gonna start doing it when you get yelled at. So I'm not judging it and there's a lot of people that do it, but I would say have a different conversation about it. And then again, ADHD is like a lot of different chronic disorders. In the beginning, you might need a lot of time and then it's like a dentist's office. Then you only have to show up, right? If you had a lot of cavities, you went to the dentist a bunch. And then all of a sudden, you're like, I'll see you in six months. That's it. I'll see you once a year. Because it's just maintenance. Because it's really just executive functioning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not therapy. It's just executive functioning. You're like, hey, are your grades doing well? So when kids go off to college, I'm always like, why don't you see me like a month in? Yeah. And then we'll just do a booster shot. And if you're good, then you keep moving. But if you're finding yourself struggling a little bit, then come back and we'll make sure that you got yourself set up and organized. Because it's not done. Because ADHD's brain is not done developing until late 20s, right? At 25, 26. So they're in college, their brain is just as ADHD, right? It's maturing a little bit and you see that, but not, they're not done. But when, they get, when they get older, they yeah. still have it. They have it, but they should have learned the skills. Okay, so that's what Well, I, I have ADHD, and um, I'm going from one office to another today, and I'm driving 100 miles an hour, you know, and it's hard for me not to mm -hmm. have a performance car, but it still comes out. And it yeah. seems normal to me to drive 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Know? And if I drive 60, I feel like I'm going Hey, can you 20. let us know when you're on the road? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I deal with a lot of people with it, and it yeah. still comes out. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the skills and stuff, but it's, um, you know, it's always there. Yeah. Well, and it's one of those things is that it's going to be. And so you figure out what is and isn't working. As we get older, you start to identify. So what are the things that I'm, it's impacting my life, and what are the things that aren't? I mean, it's a high success rate of ma failed marriages, right, because of the way. And so that worked out for me and my husband, right, 25 years, because I get it. So I'm like, oh my God, did he just walk out of the room while I was in the middle of a sentence? <laughs> Literally in the middle of a sentence. Gone. I'm like, where the hell did that go? Right? And so you start to have these appreciations, but you figure it out, right? And so that's really the thing. For kids, we want to reduce vulnerabilities and risks because kids are making decisions that is changing the course of their lives, right? And so the other phrase that I would always say is don't do something that could change the rest of your life. That's the only thing I want you to pay attention to. Just don't do something that could change the rest of your life. And if you experiment with drugs, it could change the rest of your life. And you can't understand that today, right? And so, yeah, you're going to have it. That's probably why people enjoy you, not them, but why some people enjoy riding in the car with you, right? Is that there's some parts of it yeah. that are exciting. There's parts of it that make you who you are. That's unique and special. I don't want to lose that piece out of my daughter. 
I don't want that thrill part of her gone because it makes her her and it makes her fun. I do enjoy being around her. She walks into a room and she lights it up. And so you have to find the things that are good about it because with everything, there's going to be things that you're like, I mean, I wish that that wasn't the case, but it is, right? There's plenty of squirrel moments. That's what we say in my house, right? There's squirrel moments where you, <laughs> we're like, did you just get me the Motrin? And they come in and I'm like, where's my Motrin? And they're like, oh, I saw peanut M&Ms. I got, I got you peanut M&M's. I'm like, I didn't eat peanut M&M's. I asked for Motrin. <laughs> what did you see, a squirrel? And they're like, yes, I did. I got caught up by the pretty M&M's, right? So yeah, you're not outgrowing it. Okay. Some people think, I get a lot of questions. Well, won't she outgrow this when she's, and I'm like, I don't think so. But no, not necessarily. As long as she has the skills to be able to yes. continue. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, that's for sure. You know I mean? Yeah. People don't necessarily outgrow it. Brain, it's really physiological brain. changes, but you learn to manage it. Yes. Correct. You've learned skills that are associated with you. You've learned the pros about it, and you've learned the parts that you were like, that's probably not my best. And if it bothers you enough, then you can look to address it. But yeah, you're not going to necessarily outgrow Magically, it. Yeah. yeah. Now, maybe somebody, if somebody was on a lower level of a spectrum, but it looks different because you're not the same as adolescence. Adolescence and young adulthood is plagued with impulsivity and risk taking. So those behaviors do calm down, right? And so sometimes people will confuse because they'll say, my high schooler is no longer, they don't have it anymore because they weren't, they're not jumping and doing somersaults and circles and all that stuff on the floor. And I'm like, I would hope not. I mean, he's, a, he's 16. So that would be inappropriate. Then we'd be looking at other things. Is he stealing your car? Is he sneaking out at night? It's just moving. He's not like poking people and doing somersaults because it's changed. His risks have become a little bit greater. So yeah, we don't want that to happen anymore and he's not gonna do that, but he might be sneaking out at night and he might be trying to experiment with things mm -hmm. and he might be not as honest as he used to be and he might be engaging in sports in ways that is more reckless, mm -hmm. right? So again, for my daughter, she's had five concussions. She concussed herself out of college sports because some kids, when they get a concussion and they say, you have to change your style of game, they can, not to her. And so she continued to play as aggressive as she'd always played until she couldn't play anymore, right? And so that's that shift in appreciation of it. You're not going to just grow out of it, but it might look different. So there she was much more impulsive, right? The game, she can't shut down, but is she rolling around and literally jumping on people anymore? No, <laughs> she doesn't do that, her sister, but nobody else. Can you say how else concussions affect ADHD? So I don't, I gotta be honest, I'm not sure that I think that there's enough research. They have identified a causational relationship, right? That there's cor like a correlational relationship between if you have ADHD, you have higher risks of concussions, mm -hmm. right? Probably for the reasons I just said, right? Is that my daughter can't shut down. So when she's playing aggressively, even though she knows, like, don't do a header, don't do a header, don't do a header, she goes and she does a header, right? And so she can't tie that last step. You're gonna literally not be able to play sports anymore. So I think that there increases some of the susceptibility. There's been some research that has said it's some of the, the physiological changes in the brain mm -hmm. that also create a little bit more exposure uh, an increased vulnerability. I don't know if there's been enough research that I've seen that really ties that in. And I don't know if there's really anything that says the concussions give ADHD. Because then it's a hard one. Then it's like somebody that was diagnosed with a substance use disorder that's like, they have ADHD and you're like, do they? Because it actually looks like they're post-acute. Like that looks like post-acute withdrawal. So that doesn't necessarily mean ADHD. So is she more inattentive after the concussions? Does she have a harder time staying focused? Yes. So I don't know if they can, I don't know if there's anything definitive that says the concussions increase ADHD, but there has been research that says ADHD increases concussions. And again, probably because they're a little bit more impulsive and reactive. So when we're looking at those stimulants, for somebody that has a substance use disorder, they will not be prescribed stimulants. They shouldn't be. <laughs> so if they are, they shouldn't be. Because their brain has already been exposed to uh, addiction. 
And so addiction is always going to take kind of that front step. And so it should still be treated and you can look at behavioral things. That's where you will oftentimes see somebody get treated with like Wellbutrin. So they might give them an antidepressant to help treat some of the symptoms that are associated with ADHD because Wellbutrin is not addictive, right? And so they might change the course. But stimulants, there's a lot of them. So Adderall and Concerta and Ritalin. Um, I don't know what the research is saying in regards to why do we tend to see more boys being prescribed Ritalin and Adderall and girls Concerta. Um, but Concerta is a slow acting. The other two are fast. And so they're quicker. And so normally you'll see somebody will have it and then they get diagnosed again or they have to take like a seven o'clock or they'll sometimes give them twice in a day. And so Adderall and Ritalin tend to have those fast acting. They're early in the morning and then they'd normally get like a buffer. Concerta is a slow acting. If you're doing Concerta, then you're definitely gonna wanna, I mean, you should be doing the skills no matter what. To me, you should be doing the skills no matter what, period. Your brain is a muscle. The medication is to help you to play on an even playing field so that you can learn the same skills that all the other kids are learning. Without learning those skills, it literally is like giving somebody insulin and they continue to eat donuts. It's not that the medication stopped becoming effective, it's that you're not doing anything to allow it to be effective. So skills have to be a part of that, whether you are providing those skills, and there's wonderful books and resources, the irony is that there's books for kids with ADHD and adults, guess what they don't read? Yeah. Books. So they're not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm always like, if you love somebody with ADHD, you're going to have to do the reading because <laughs> they're not going to do the reading because they're not a big fan of reading long books <laughs> about ADHD. And so it's normally that way. I was just going to say, what you said earlier, um, would that mean that my son, who was addicted to heroin and his physicians knew he was addicted to heroin, his physicians should have stopped prescribing Adderall for him at that point? Because so they, it's he continued to, to take it right up until the day he died. So it's a tricky situation, right? Because a medical doctor is a medical doctor, and I am not one. Mm -hmm. But I still stand by what I said. But I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I can't, I can't say why a doctor, because they have their own reasons and their own medical stance in regards to why and what they do. But as a treatment provider, I'm going to say that would be a concern for me. Mm -hmm. But a medical doctor is a, doing it through a medical perspective. A lot of them still do it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work out well. But a lot of, <coughs> I've seen a lot of psychiatrists that will still give, it, give um, stimulants to people with um, substance use disorders. But they are really an increased risk, and they do usually abuse them. Yeah. You know, I think it's just, you know, we're again, as you know, as you guys are here and we're having these conversations about ADHD and we do these trainings in regards to co-occurring disorders and substance use, I think the more that we start to know, you know, there's an unfortunate thing is like we have like knowledge within our own fields, but sometimes our fields don't have knowledge about each other. Yes. Right, and so a well-intentioned physician might be doing what he has been trained to do, which is to treat this ADHD, but maybe doesn't have a full appreciation of what substance use is. And so there is a movement, and I, you know, I will say, I mean, I'm proud to be a part of RCA that even though I kid and say, are, where else are you sending me? Is that they do a lot of educating, like doctors and nurses and community members and whoever will listen to say, here's some of these risks. Because this started in a field where doctors were prescribing things that I'm not sure that they had full information and knowledge about the addictive qualities to it and, and how we got to where we are, because that was our field. And now we're seeing this marriage between these fields of being like, we gotta work together because there's people's lives that are at stake. And so I think that's where this conversation is moving. And so if it's you as advocacy to say, I'm worried about, you know, it's a fine line though because I also work with families and if you try to say to, as a family member, I don't think that they should be on a stimulant if the doctor's already said to the patient, they can. The patient's gonna be like, stop being so controlling, get out of my life. <laughs> so I'm appreciative of that, but that's really where being a part of a conversation is really to me some of those steps of like how do we get rid of the stigma so that it is not in silos that we are treating this? How do we have conversations about the importance of ADHD where we're not you know, stigmatizing it, where we're not minimizing it, where we're being really honest in regards to what are the risks 
And then how do we understand how to advocate within a physician to say, these are some of my concerns still. And so that's really, I think, where we're trying to move is to get as much information and education by those that have the knowledge to blend together. Yeah. But I'm to sorry that. for your loss. That's okay. Um, I'm Lisa Gray, by the way. I, unfortunately, I'm sorry I was late. And maybe you touched on this before I came in, but I'm sitting here wondering if you have talked about the difficulties of an adult with ADHD parenting a child with ADHD. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. Those challenges That's amount wrong. to... Hopefully somebody doesn't have it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is because it's, again, it, because it's a spectrum is that here's the thing, ADHDs don't all look alike, right? So you got an inattentive and then you have a hyperactive and they're all like, you got to think the way that I think because we just saw how they think, right? It's a little bit of tunnel vision. <laughs> and so it is a balancing act. This is where that chaos. And so I think, again, I know I keep saying this, but the more that people have conversations, not when they're mad, mm -hmm. which is what we're all used to. Mm -hmm. When we're angry is where we have most of our conversations. But at that point, everybody's defensive. But when we're not, to just say, these are some of those things, you know, and in, in that respect, I've had to walk that line, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know my husband had ADHD until six years into my marriage, because it just was, right? I, obviously, I like those qualities. Um, but then there's things that I'm like, hers is different, mm -hmm. right? So it bothers him that she leaves all those cabinets open, <laughs> because to him, he's so meticulous. Mm -hmm. His ADHD is more of like the... Like, focus. So he's like, how do you leave all these things open? What it? And then he'd get up and he'd start shutting. And I'm like, why would she ever shut a door again? Yeah. If you shut them, why would she? I can't stand having them open. I'm like, just wait, like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because I can't have you shutting them because then she'll never shut them again. Then we're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives, right? So it is. But I do genuinely feel like that's the conversations. If you don't have it, you have to start to find humor in it. Because otherwise you're like, huh, it's literally everywhere, right? <laughs> it's literally everywhere around me. And then find where everybody does well. Because defensiveness within a family can take hold and change the dynamics. And when everybody feels that they're defending themselves or feeling like they have to justify because they don't feel heard, everybody feels like you're telling them to do something they're not sure how to do, defensiveness starts to rule mm -hmm. the house. And so conversations of saying, we need to be able to have a conversation where you don't have to worry, I'm not attacking you. You don't have to defend yourself. I just want to figure out how do we want to keep moving this because we're all working for the same thing. But those are conversations that we don't normally have because we normally just wait. We're like, oh, phew, it's gone. I'm just going to wait to the next thing. But it's gonna, there is a next thing. There is always a next thing. <laughs> yeah. It's always going to come. And so when the dust is settled, that's really a great opportunity to have those conversations. To say, how do we want to navigate through this? How do you tap out? How do I tap out? How do we support each other? Because it's there. Any other questions? Again, I know I started moving through a little bit quicker. Can you say that somebody suffering from ADHD um, can't abuse the medication because it's helping them? It's so anybody can abuse anything, but they are less likely because it's actually doing for their brain. So it actually increases that dopamine and increases the norepinephrine enough to allow their brain to get to base. But I will say if they abuse other substances, marijuana is one of the highest comorbidities as like a starter drug for somebody with ADHD. Um, then at that point, anything is off, right? So once addiction sets inside somebody's brain, all bets are off. Then anything can become an addictive substance. Does that make sense? So if addiction sets in, all bets are off. Addiction is always going to precede anything else. So if you have anxiety disorder and an addiction takes place, you're going to abuse anything that starts to come in, even if you genuinely have anxiety, right? So a benzo is addictive now. And so, but if you are being treated for ADHD and you are prescribed your stimulant and taking it as prescribed, mm -hmm. you run a lower risk for a substance use disorder. But if you've already had it and you're in, um, you know, you're sober, but you still have ADHD and you're gonna go back to college. Yeah, so Stratera is a non-stimulant. So that's ADHD medication for um, 
That's a non-stimulant, mm -hmm. right? So it can't be abused. So Stratera is a good one. Um, again, a lot of times people will prescribe Wellbutrin, which is an antidepressant because it just helps to calm the brain down a little bit. But they're conversations, right? So an adult you want to have, I'm telling you, you need to have their cortex being activated. And so those are conversations to say, I wonder if you could try this and maybe have somebody help you with some of these other skills. For young adults, when parents try to get involved, they don't want you in there. That's a natural progression of young adulthood. They're looking for their own independence. So they're looking to push you out. And so I always say it's dropping nuggets. It's saying I'm worried about some of the, I'm worried about the addictive things. You know, I talked to somebody or I heard something, and I'm worried about the stimulant. I wonder, could you talk to your doctor about Stratera? Could we have a conversation about having one of these other things? Because they don't want this either. But if they're going to have to fight you, or listen, they're going to fight you. So when you just leave it in a place where their cortex is having to be activated, then they're not defending it. Then you're literally dropping nuggets. You're giving them tools and you're giving them information. These are some of the risks. This is what I had heard. Why don't you talk to your doctor about it and let me know if I can help with anything. But I know that this isn't what you want. And that's a sentence that can be said over and over again. I know that this isn't what you want. And so this is what I heard were some of the risks. And allow them to start thinking about it on their own because the beauty of somebody with ADHD is after they've walked out, they do think about it. They're like, oh crap. <laughs> did, but I'm not saying it to you because I don't want you getting involved in my life because they're used to parents being over top of them. Yeah. So they're even stronger with ADHD trying to get you out, but they're not ready yet, right? And so when they turn this magical number of 18, they aren't ready to be done. So it isn't all or nothing. So it's trying to find space that they can keep having a conversation with you that allows them some independence. But it makes sense of why those, adult, those young adults in particular are really like, get out. I don't want you. To. And so when you give them advice, they're like, no, this is the dumbest. I mean, and I've had those. So in fairness, this is my career. I literally have said to my daughter, you know, people pay me money <laughs> to do this. Like, I'm, I'm literally giving you a skill. Like, I get paid for this. She was like, you're an idiot, right? Like, no. And so it was where I was like, okay, here's some of the information. <laughs> you call me if you need me. This is what I think because I know what you want. I know you want to do well. I know these are important to you. So here's what I would recommend. And then I backed out. So she didn't have to fight me anymore. Then she had to think about it and she either made a good decision or she didn't make a good decision and she learned from either. Some are harder lessons than others. Do you, you probably already went over this. Um, do we understand why people with ADHD are more prone to substance abuse? Physiological, psychological, like what's going on there? So probably a little bit of both. So the vulnerabilities are going to be, we definitely know that there's the vulnerabilities in regards to the chemicals in their brain, right? So the lower level, so when you have a dopamine deficiency, it increases your risk for a substance use. Um, and so we know that to be true for somebody with ADHD. We also know that because of the other chemicals, they're more likely to be impulsive um, and take greater risks at a time that is inherent to that age. So as adolescents, where a lot of substance use starts, they're already more inclined to take risks and be impulsive. And when you have somebody with ADHD, it increases for them. So they're more likely to be like, I'll try that, I'll do that, I don't, because they're not weighing those, and then they have that dopamine deficiency. So there's, they need a little bit more than somebody else would need in order to get those same results. So there's the physiological, I mean, in a very short summary, right, of, of more complicated. That's kind of the summary of the physiological vulnerabilities. The psychological vulnerabilities is that that little child grows up to feel less than um, depressed, anxious because they're trying to do really well and so the comorbidity of having anxiety or depression can also start to set in even though that's not as a result of the ADHD like those don't have to hold hands but if you've been trying at school and then you know you're about to go to school and you know that you're going to fail this test or you don't feel prepared for it or you know you're about to go home and you're going to get in trouble because you keep doing really bad that starts to create anxiety if you're feeling really bad about yourself i'm so stupid i don't know why i, I can't do this right i don't know why then you start to see signs of depression and that changes the serotonin and so again when you're using substances it increases those chemicals that when somebody gets that nobody's you know, I'm always surprised because people always talk about chasing that high. 
I'm, I'm oftentimes saying, I think people are just getting to that place where they just feel good. It's less about being high and more just being okay, right? And the high comes with it, but I think most people are just trying to feel okay. Yeah, I mean, you grow up being told you're wrong all the time. Yeah. And so it changes the physiological components and you just say, why would I do it different? But again, you know, when I do these trainings with brains, like your brain, when it's emotionally triggered, doesn't say if it's right or wrong or good or bad. It just says, did it work or no? And so that's where substances come in because the judgment isn't in the emotional part of the brain. The brain and the emotion part just says, did it work or no? And it did. It just said it has these consequences. Mm -hmm. And you've got somebody with ADHD that the cortex isn't at its you know, it's top functioning, and so the consequences would be like, you shouldn't do that, I'm gonna lose my job, I'm not gonna be able to go to school. But that part is delayed in regards to somebody with ADHD, all adolescents, in particular with ADHD, and so they're not able to get a hold of that part of the brain that would finally say, stop, what is happening, you can't do this. But in that moment, it just made them feel okay. I think that idea of people always thinking, and again, I'm not saying that people don't get high, but I think everybody thinks of it as like somebody trying to like do something that's like so superficial. I don't really believe that to be true. I think people are just trying to feel okay. So besides substance use disorders, what are some other things that we know that adults with untreated ADHD have an increased likelihood of experiencing in their lives? I mean, computer gaming addiction. <laughs> Other addictions yeah. can be increased. I mean, divorces increase. Mm -hmm. You know, hypersexuality. Hypersexuality, domestic violence. Like, there's there's some consequences. Again, it's a you know it's a spectrum disorder. So there's a continuum of care. And so, the untreated is that there's conflicts that are associated with the relationships. ADHD feeds off of that, and that's where I was saying the portal. ADHD starts to feed off of the negative conflict because it's stimulating to the brain. The brain, I just said, doesn't care if it's right or wrong, good or bad. It just says, did it, wor did it work or not? And if you start getting into an argument with somebody, it does stimulate your brain. It's like negative reinforcement, right? And so we didn't like it, but it reinforced my brain. And so you see a lot of conflict. I will say, though, that people with ADHD, that when it is treated, are wonderful, obviously, right? Three of my best friends, I'm married to somebody for 25 years, right? I have a 23-year-old daughter, so I don't want anybody to walk out of here being like, wow, ADHD is, is some curse that no. somebody has. It really is this beautiful superpower. I you said it best when you said it was a superpower and you can use it for the force of Yeah, evil good or evil, good. yeah. It's, it's gonna be managed or it's going to manage you, but I think that as we have more conversation, because this is the only disorder that because nobody understands it and people aren't appreciating it, they're dismissing it. And then what happens is that leaves the person with ADHD to create a narrative. Mm -hmm. If somebody was depressed, people would be saying, are you all right, what do I need to do? If somebody's anxious, you're like, why don't you take a breath? You need to, you start going and offering support and with ADHD, you're like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Like, what are you doing? Like, this is ridiculous. There's no, there's no leaning in experience for ADHD and everybody is minimizing it. Yeah. And in our treatment world, I've been doing these trainings because I'm like, this shouldn't be like an afterthought of like, oh yeah, they got substance use and like ADHD. I'm like, no, ADHD <laughs> means you better have treatment goals on there. You come into our program, you better have treatment goals associated with ADHD because they're just as relevant, if not more, than if like you, I diagnosed somebody with depression. You better treat it because we have a lot of expectations about what they do in aftercare. They gotta be organized, they gotta show up. The time sequence thing is important in recovery. Not if they didn't learn the skills. So it better be a part of their treatment plan if they have it, right? So it's moving in a direction of trying to say, pay attention. So tonight you can give us some good examples of how to put tools in the person's toolbox that has ADHD. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.